All right. Here we go. That was very kind and very uh, welcoming. I will say it was a personal privilege uh, back in 2011 uh, to celebrate the launch of the OCP uh, while I was serving as C Chief Technology Officer. We were particularly fond of this uh, initiative and the impact it would have on the environment. So thank you so much for all that you've done. If you'll indulge me, I want to share a few perspectives this morning on how the spirit of openness can drive breakthrough ideas and solutions in the areas of the economy that need it most. We'll talk a little bit about healthcare and education and the environment, but I want to begin with a bit of a question. What platform, digital platform, was the first to reach a billion users? Anybody want to shout out the name of that digital platform? I hear Facebook. That would not be correct. It would be the government of India's Aadhaar platform. Yet, what are you talking about? Uh, in 2010, President Obama visited India, and I had the pleasure of connecting him to a number of initiatives that were just at that time getting off the ground. A remote village that had no indoor plumbing, no access to traditional infrastructure, no paved roads. Uh, the government of India chose to make that the test bed where they would deploy uh, fiber broadband to a village hut and the beginnings of a civic engagement initiative. You could see President Obama interacting uh, virtually with uh, those villagers less than 90 days after the infrastructure had been deployed to hear stories about how access to information has changed the lives of people who frankly hadn't even known to ask for this infrastructure but for this experiment in the public sector. One small example, a young man was in graduate school uh, and had the difficult choice when a grandmother had fallen ill. Nobody else could care for her. He either would have cared for her and dropped out of school or he would have ignored her needs. He was able to stay in the community and finish his studies through distance education. But at the time, India had just begun its revolution to associate a digital identity with every uh, resident of the country. That initiative scaled over the last six, seven years to the point where over a billion folks in that country how, have now the capacity to schedule an online appointment at the health system to set up a bank account without having to go through a lot of bureaucracy and to generally speaking engage in the civic sector, the public sector, with services that are needed in a manner that they could not, regardless of their stature in life. This new environment, this opportunity to innovate, to have platforms that are open that allow others to build, that was the heart of the work that I tried to do for President Obama in answer of his call to see if we could close the gap between the entrepreneurial spirit we'd seen in the private sector and in the same ecosystem of problem solvers that typically traverse the public and the private sectors. To advise the president, I looked at several case studies that helped to inform the strategy that we deployed. First, I called the chief technology officer, Procter & Gamble, who at the time had been uh, overseeing the transition when their then CEO, A.G. Laffley, had made the claim half of all the new products and services out of Procter & Gamble would come from ideas outside of their famous lab network. I'd asked the CTO, was this a punch in the gut? What did it feel like to be told on one day that your team could only produce half the necessary output for growth in our firm? Bruce's response is exactly was what I was hoping it would be, which is, Anish, it wasn't a punch in the gut, it was liberating. We had the opportunity to do what we always knew could be done, bring ideas from the outside, but in the past, the not invented here syndrome limited their effectiveness. So I asked Bruce, I said, tell me just as an example, when you opened up, where did you find some of the innovations that made Procter & Gamble more successful? And he said, well, actually, one of our first innovations came out of the federal government. I said, wait a second, Bruce, I'm supposed to take lessons from you to make government more efficient and effective. You're telling me that we had a great idea that you used? And he said, yes. It turns out that making diapers is hard. And one of the reasons why it's hard is that there has to be this very sensitive material that can absorb uh, water, if you will, at the base of the diaper. And to produce these diapers at a thousand a minute, you had to be really precise in the production process and how you would deposit this very sensitive material. Turns out 
there's another construction process or manufacturing process that has a similar property. The construction of nuclear weapons. We care a lot about the efficiency and effectiveness with which sensitive nuclear materials handled in the manufacturing process. The national labs had deployed open source software that would allow us to optimize or to model and simulate that information, that uh, chemical flow. And when Procter & Gamble learned of these underlying modeling and software uh, simulation techniques, they were able to repurpose those very same tools into the production process for, di for diaper production, generating over a billion dollars of cash flow improvement to Procter & Gamble shareholders. I was so impressed with this story, I had to have him share it directly with President Obama, where after learning that story, he had then gone on to ad-lib in his next speech, much to the chagrin of those who were listening, about the relationship between nuclear weapons and diaper production. Confused everybody, but it was very exciting at the time. The second case study, since many of you are obviously part of the Facebook family here today, uh, the second of these case studies came from a conversation with Sheryl Sandberg. This is a, a, a session that we held on the subject of jobs in the economy. And the question on the table was whether or not we were going to see a growth rate in the IT sector for jobs and whether we could properly train all Americans for these industries of the future. In preparation for the event, Cheryl had done some homework. I'm going to be somewhat off on the numbers. You all might correct me. But roughly at the time, Facebook had about 3,000 employees. And a question that she'd asked the HR department was roughly how many people held the job title Facebook developer? Now, since many of you work at Facebook, I'm curious, how many of you know, anyone want to shout out the answer? What, what, how many people held the job title of Facebook developer? This is circa 2010, 2011. Anybody want to take a stab? The answer was north of 35,000. And for those of us who thought we were good at math, there was a little bit of a disconnect. And the answer was, as you might imagine, the developer platform was open. So if Nike wanted to build a Facebook application, Nike could put on its P&L a Facebook developer. And that got us thinking about the idea of platform and leverage. Three million federal civilian workers. Imagine if we had 35 million people helping to build products and services to help your interactions with government better. So these were the principles that animated a lot of our open innovation strategy. And they all drew from a core principle that we adopted early in the Obama administration, which drew from Bill Joy, the co-founder of Sun Microsystems, that no matter who you are, most of the smartest people would be working for someone else. It emphasizes the power of collaboration, as Archana just said before I came up. Now, what would that look like in practice? Well, it looks like a bunch of kids from UNC Morrison Hall. Just see what we can do. We adopted an open innovation strategy in almost all aspects of the public sector. And to give you an example of what that looked like, the Environmental Protection Agency had issued a call to action, what they called the Battle of the Buildings Challenge. And the idea was, if we simply encourage the community to come up with their own solutions, how might we uh, scale the best of those ideas and ensure others can replicate? Well, the good folks at uh, UNC Morrison Hall had done what everybody else had discussed doing. They thought about putting solar panels on the roof, they talked about other uh, installations or hardware that would be deployed to make energy efficiency and re renewable energy a better source of their overall mix. But it turned out that the biggest innovation that they had was simply linking two databases. They had a database of uh, a occupancy rate. They had the cards that you scan when you get into the dorm. And they knew uh, what the automated, automatic controls could do on the uh, heating and uh, air conditioning systems. So they simply wrote a simple if-then rule. If occupancy falls to something like 60 or 70 percent, then let's allow the building to float several degrees in temperature. That one rule accounted for nearly 90 percent of their resulting 36 percent reduction in energy savings. Now, that was a terribly 
uh, eye-opening story for us because we've been pushing the idea that we had huge capital investments necessary to make energy efficiency work. And yet the most successful strategy involved hardly any capital deployment, but just a clever use or reuse of information. This spirit of open data and open innovation has carried forward in nearly every sector of the economy. McKinsey has published their own findings that suggest that if we harness the full value of, op of openly available data in education and healthcare and other regulated sectors of the economy, we could generate $3 trillion of economic growth. So much potential if we embrace the philosophy of openness and collaboration. Industries that have not been very productive in the past, like the one that I spend my, most of my time in today in healthcare, know that if they properly deployed data-driven decision-making, they could achieve 5 to 6% boosts in productivity. The business case is evident, the culture is beginning to shift, and we're starting to see a bipartisan commitment to a philosophy of openness and collaboration. And so what I'd like to do with the time we have is to share five key lessons or principles that I believe will be the cornerstone of how we solve big problems in the years to follow. And they build very strongly on this ecosystem that you have established with the OCP initiative. The cornerstone of my remarks is a strategy document that President Obama had ushered, and by the way, has carried forward even in the Trump administration. The Strategy for American Innovation a vision for how we would build an economy that works better for everyone, but reimagines the role of the public sector in helping to liberate uh, all of our economic prospects. The principle here had been that the formula of yesterday needed a new tune-up. Historically, governments could make investments in traditional infrastructure, roadways, railways, and runways. And if we made said investments, we would allow the economy at large to thrive. In today's increasingly digital economy, we see these five key elements as necessary ingredients for economic growth. One, we have to reimagine that infrastructure investment to include digital. Two, we need to find clever ways to bring the industry together on standards and interoperability so we can facilitate what is otherwise a fragmented, uh, multiple uh, fragmented sectors of the economy to come together to uh, accomplish new opportunities. Third, we wanted to make a key principle here that all government data would be held in machine readable form by default to be publicly available in uh, a whole variety of formats. Fourth, and this gets to the point that uh, Archana made. It may be in certain circumstances, the government offers some direct services, but the bigger opportunity we see in digital is to make a lot of these services available through wholesale channel, which means that we'll have a marketplace of commercially competitive products and services to help people live better lives in healthcare and energy and education. Last but certainly not least, where we spend our resources, we would shift more and more of them to reward outcomes, not just the traditional delivery of programs. A word on each. For us, cloud computing was a building block. We made a judgment early in the Obama administration that we wanted to move to a cloud-first technical architecture. This was as much a cultural change as it was a technical adjustment, because at that time, the nearly $80 billion of government spent on IT had traditionally gone to legacy architecture and mostly through services contractors who would presumably provide uh, the work orders that were needed but would not help us transform the enterprise for future growth. To give you a window into how we thought of this issue, I want to describe a little bit of the time to market here. The National Science Foundation had awarded a research grant to a professor by the name of Wolski in uh, Santa Barbara. This research grant was designed to link a private cloud with the public cloud. And the work was so successful, Professor Wolski had commercialized it less than 
two years after he had been awarded the grant. That turned out to be the Eucalyptus uh, software program, the open source uh, model for, for uh, managing cloud computing. NASA had adopted this very same infrastructure and used it to be the backbone of a program called Nebula. And Nebula had gotten so successful that within a few months of our arrival, we made the judgment that to demonstrate the president's commitment to a cloud-first architecture, we would move his signature initiative, a spending platform called USAspending.gov, where every American could log in and see exactly to the penny how much money the government was spending on XYZ service, to move that uh, website and its uh, underlying database to the Nebula infrastructure. It was a culture change to the agencies to know that we were going to force each and every one of them to move at least one service to the cloud, uh, and hopefully three and more, within the first 18 months of our arrival. This infrastructure as a service has permeated a lot of activity, whether it be in the energy sector with investments in the smart grid, or in the healthcare sector with investments in electronic health records, and even in the education sector with our investments in learning health systems, uh, in, learning, in uh, personal learning systems. Each and every one of these infrastructure investments were meant to be made openly available so that we could build products and services that could help people learn, save energy, live healthier lives. The challenge for us was the need to link those investments with the ability to open up the underlying data. That required us to involve ourselves in industry-led consensus efforts, standards development, basically. One of the challenges we face in solving problems is how do you move highly competitive markets to a common standard when so much of the business model is tied to keeping people uh, locked into your legacy environment? Well, in some cases, we had regulatory authority. In other cases, we could make R&D investments to encourage people to build those technical standards. But in all cases, we had this convening power. And it was that convening power that we hadn't really used in years past that we thought would be critical for success. Just a few miles up the road uh, in uh, Northern California, I had the pleasure of calling on this chief information officer of Pacific Gas and Electric, basically a cold call, and I'd asked the CIO what the likelihood would be for her to help lead an effort to open up the energy meter data that was now accessible because we've digitized most of those historically analog meters. The technology for this was trivial, but the business model and the go-to-market strategy required a lot more uh, leadership. Answering my call, uh, Karen Austin decided to convene her peers here in California and to ask the question, why can't we make it easier for consumers of our respective utility services to access their real-time energy usage in a simple, standardized method? What became known as the Green Button Connect technical standard took off because a few people made the voluntary choice that they would work together and to contribute to the greater good what they were able to do. Once the regulators realized that there were consensus technical specifications for how to do this, in city after city or state after state, we've now seen organizations require that if the utility company installs smart meter infrastructure, that they must include the ability for consumers of that infrastructure, residents, to be able to access their energy consumption data with the simple ease with which I can authorize my Netflix account uh, for uh, Apple TV or what have you. And you could see here an example at PG&E where a person that purchased uh, solar panels from company X can now connect their solar panel production data with their energy consumption data and use the resulting insights to help them optimize their energy bill. This is the opportunity that I see in health, in energy, education, and banking to work together to unlock the underlying limitations on information access and use as we look to bring new products and services to market. Now, it's one thing to have technical standards for uh, these uh, uh, systems to communicate with each other, but what about the largest data holder of them all, which is the federal government? 
going back to the founding of our country, Thomas Jefferson had been a bit of an open data enthusiast himself. Mr. Jefferson used to record weather data twice a day, every day, and to share it with his fellow weather enthusiasts across the colonies. You might be interested to know that on July 4th, 1776, the weather was mild in Philly with a high of 76 degrees. The spirit of Jefferson carried forward when he dispatched Lewis and Clark to go examine the, the, the West with instructions to bring back information on the climate that can be made available to the American people. Mr. Jefferson, as he becomes president and carries that vision forward, inspires the National Weather Service to follow that very lead. Today, you and I might have different applications or methods by which we access weather information, maybe on a mobile phone, maybe on the radio, maybe over television. But what we all share is that the underlying data used by what is now a $5 billion competitive marketplace comes from the same source, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Our federal government is the data supplier, if you will, for a competitive marketplace, not just for consumers of weather data, but increasingly business and industrial use. We have a new playbook in the federal government to take what we had done in the weather economy and to scale it across every domain where the federal government's been involved. We can expose more health data, more energy data, more education data. The visual representation of this, by the way, is accessible to everybody on data.gov. But my encouragement here is to suggest that perhaps as you get to know opportunities to collaborate, you might take advantage of some of those data sets and put them to their highest and best use to help people live better lives. Here you can see data from the, uh, one of the national labs that provides for you a framework on exactly how electricity prices differ across the country. And you can subscribe to that API so that you could understand when and how you might best influence what it is that you're building. For obvious reasons, a big reason for uh, the success of OCP in the public domain is the effect you've had on energy prices as we shift more and more of our capacity to these uh, cloud-based, uh, these data centers. And so my hope is that you might imagine a world where you could take advantage of these openly available data sets with the production uh, information that you've spun out within OCP and allow you to understand ways to tweak even more the efficiencies that you've already squeezed out of our infrastructure. Fourth, I want to share with you a little bit of that enabler comment that Archana made, because it does speak volumes to how we may consume services that we otherwise think of as government services today, but tomorrow might be made available through some other channel. And it's enabling the opportunity for wholesale delivery of information as opposed to just retail. A little bit of context, and then I'll uh, be sure to share some examples for you. When the, uh, you might have parents that are on Medicare or grandparents, the opportunity that emerged in the uh, late, uh, two th early 2000s was to move as much of the information about Medicare performance onto the internet. We launched a website, I should say the government did, I wasn't involved at the original time, where uh, individuals could log into mymedicare.gov and access three years of their claims history for purposes of understanding whether or not they were uh, using certain services more than they should or they were not getting the care that they were entitled to. And that information was accessible through a portal. Not many people knew to schedule or to register for an account. Very few people were logged in. So early in the year 2010 or so, we decided that we would make it easier for people to take that information and download it through a blue button that we posted on that website that says, hey, you may not really understand what this is, but if you push this blue button, you might be able to share it with organizations or applications who can help you make sense of it. The retail service was the ability to provide that claims history in digital format. Last week, the Trump administration finalized a next version of that program, a full open API so that now north of 200 app developers at last count can build products and services that would allow you to directly connect your grandmother's Medicare data feed to an application that might alert you as a loved one or even he or she 
directly about preventive services that they haven't had or a wellness visit that they're entitled to that they haven't yet taken advantage of. Or if they've had a negative experience to route them to better, higher quality providers. You could see one example of an app developer that's beginning to request that uh, data feed by offering consumers a value-added service in exchange for that uh, trusted feed. This is becoming the new default in regulatory policy. Don't just make someone log into a website or to make available information on a specific place. Allow that information to follow whatever the competitive market might surface that will compete to help people make the most use of it. We're using standard open APIs to enable this type of functionality so that a consumer can literally, with no muss or fuss, choose from that growing cadre of applications and authorize that the connection be made safely and securely. Last but certainly not least, as we look to solve problems, we are shifting the way we pay to reward outcomes and value. And in no sector of the economy has this been most powerful than in healthcare. You will see a great deal of demand for more ha applications and services in healthcare, in large part because the uh, US economy pays too much and uh, receives too little in, in terms of outcomes for the dollars that we invest. We are now shifting the public dollar to allow us to say, if you can consume fewer resources but have better outcomes, we're willing to reward the doctors and hospitals that are helping you navigate the system to have those better outcomes by giving them higher reimbursement on account of that work. That has unleashed a flurry of activity. Organizations that are propping up in communities all over the country, trying to help patients, doctors, and hospitals come together and to make the best use of that information to make sure they avoid that unnecessary hospitalization or avoid the emergency room when they could have gotten care in a lower cost, better quality setting. This opportunity of shifting the public dollar towards outcomes will unleash a great deal of economic activity in health and energy and education. I want to wrap up my remarks to you and to celebrate the work that you're doing within OCP by highlighting what I think is the next big opportunity and the challenge that we have to confront as an industry. It's no news to anybody who's watching today that the concerns on automation and the impact of our technology-rich environment are starting to play themselves out in how we relate to one another. Too many people feel as if they're left behind in this digital revolution that their kids and their grandkids, for the first time, more Americans feel as if they will have a, f a weaker future. They will not be as successful as this current generation. It had always been the American dream that no matter where you lived, no matter who you were, no matter what your background, you always felt that your kids would be better off than you were. To restore that sense of hope and optimism, I believe the challenge for our industry and the challenge for us as a whole community is to unleash the power and potential of all of these same technologies and to apply them in how we connect, better connect talent with opportunity. Once again, McKinsey had done a study that, off, that suggested that we could boost the global economy by nearly $3 trillion just by investing in understanding better the skills that we have, the skills that are in demand, and the training programs that can close the gap if we see any so that we know, each and every one of us, what the next move in our economic ladder might look like to help us get to that American dream. This is the challenge of our era, and I believe if we work together in the same spirit of collaboration that's enabled OCP to thrive, we can apply these very same principles to make an economy that works for everyone. This is a discussion that's happening all across the country today, and I hope with your contribution and input, it could be make, made real for those who could so desperately benefit from its output. I wish you the very best in the rest of your two days. I thank you for hearing me out, and I thank the OCP for doing what it's doing to make our computing platform more reliable, more robust, and more efficient for all of us. Thank you all very much.